Welcome to Lift Every Voice as we recognize the 156th commemoration of Juneteenth. This production is hosted by 10 African American museums from coast to coast, known as the Black Freedom Collective. These 10 African American museums have once again joined forces to commemorate Juneteenth, the day that the Emancipation Proclamation was officially enforced ending enslavement in Texas and thus in the United States. Together, these museums will explore the deep-rooted anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, through the eyes of historians, choirs, anthropologists, poets, and communities from across the United States. Juneteenth is an important part of our history and culture. On June 19, 1865, the enslaved people of Texas, then the most remote region of the Confederacy, at last learned that all enslaved people were free. Upon hearing the news, they broke into Jubilee. The news arrived more than two years after Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, officially freeing the enslaved and Confederate states in rebellion to the Union. Juneteenth endures as part of our collective memory and culture. Today, this national virtual commemoration frames the holiday as an opportunity for us all to lift our voices. Stay tuned for the remainder of today's program, which will feature readings from members of the United States Congressional Black Caucus and elected officials from across the country, as well as national luminaries Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, Educator, Dr. Janetta Besh Cole, and Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Mr. Lonnie Bunch. Today's program features cultural performances, artistic expressions, spoken word, debut of a new African-American choir, and so much more. Yes, stay tuned and let us lift every voice this Juneteenth. Hi, I'm Bina Elliott, Head of Advancing Black Pathways for J.P. Morgan Chase. And we are proud sponsors of the Juneteenth celebration. It is a great time in our country to celebrate how far we've come since 1865. But it is also a time for us to acknowledge how far we have to go, which is exactly why J.P. Morgan Chase launched Advancing Black Pathways over two years ago. It was to address the systemic areas where Blacks have lagged behind other groups. That's an educational attainment, wealth creation, and inclusion in the workforce in a much broader way. We know that we, the work is still to be done, which is why we launched a 30 billion, and that's with a B, commitment last October to address the racial equity gap in this country. We're focused on four key areas business growth and entrepreneurship, helping to grow those small businesses, improving home ownership opportunities, increasing the financial health in our black communities, and ensuring that our workforce is inclusive and diverse. The work that we want to achieve at Advancing Black Pathways can only happen when we partner with great organizations. I can't thank you enough, and on behalf of J.P. Morgan Chase, for the work that you do to help create, understanding, and educate people on the Black culture and our traditions. Hope you have a great Juneteenth celebration. And if you want to find out more about Advancing Black Pathways, please go to jpmorganchase.com forward slash A-B-P. Thank you. To commemorate this historical moment, the T-Mobile Foundation, in partnership with the Northwest African American Museum, will give out thousands of children's books nationwide featuring black characters, because black children should see themselves everywhere, and books are just the start. 
For years, Black museums across the nation have stood as gathering places for heritage and hope in communities. It is within Black museums that history and destiny converge. It is here that we make sense of the painful past and envision a brighter future. Let's look at liberty through song, poetry, and dance, presented by the August Wilson African American Cultural Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, followed by Charlotte, North Carolina's award-winning poet, Blues, leading the viewer on a journey across the city and shares how faith has sustained African Americans in our continuing fight for freedom, presented by the Harvey Gantt Center for African American Arts and Culture in Charlotte, North Carolina, and inspired by an exhibition called Vision and Spirit. And hope. Hope is explored today by our friends at the Northwest African American Museum, located in Seattle, Washington. They will present a multimedia performance of a classic song filled with hope. Get comfortable, you are in for a treat. Juneteenth serves as an opportunity for us as African Americans to cherish our culture and heritage and explore the meaning of freedom for black people. Of course, we honor and amplify the vibrancy and complexity of the black experience in all that we do at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center. I'm Janice Burley Wilson, President and CEO. Our mission is to be a home for the art, storytelling and exchange of ideas related to the African American experience and the African diaspora. August Wilson's work documenting the black experience in the 20th century explored the ongoing personal quest for freedom and liberty for his characters. The plays portray the historical trajectory of African Americans through their transition from property to personhood. August Wilson's writing created an American theatrical revolution. The plays provided opportunities for black artists, actors, and playwrights freedom to truly explore the trauma of slavery, poetically, rhythmically, and with humor and music. August Wilson said that community is the most valuable thing that you have in African American culture. Today, meet members of our artist community that support the August Wilson African American Cultural Center mission. We tell stories across genres. I hope that you enjoy these cultural gifts that we will share with you today. Thank you. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of Let our rejoicing rise as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? This is what the Founding Fathers promised us, right? America, the place where your dreams come true. The oasis, but only for few. Black America, when they say liberty for all, they left out one thing, you. Dirty and inferior, they call our skin, while theirs is white and pure, absent from sin. But to us, 
freedom was never handed. Did they really expect us not to demand it? To sweep 400 years of bondage under the rug, quietly forgotten, buried without a thought. They tell us, shut up and dribble, stay in your place. And we're supposed to accept these small tokens of progress with smiles and thanks? If freedom is the power to make your own decisions, then liberty is the freedom to walk through your own neighborhood without a red target sewn onto your linens. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But who in the world gets treated as good as this? Not George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. After Trayvon was born, they killed him 17 years later. One day soon, true freedom will reign. Wildflowers of liberty will sprout from the earth again. What is freedom? Freedom is the agency by which we leave our mark on the world. So many things are overpriced and overrated. Some of the only things that are worth what they cost freedom, love, and art. And without freedom, you cannot love and you cannot create. Freedom is the agency by which we leave our mark on the world. Freedom is rooted underneath our tongues. A lineage of outspoken, rebel, and heathen, and the like. Each colloquial saying, slaying the rights written so left over the tide, like waters we rise and we rise. Freedom, a crescendo, a cataclysm, 
a conjuring of redemption. I couldn't tell you what it tastes like, only that I know it is sweeter than those forbidden fruits. It is full harvest, it is hard truths, freedom. I couldn't tell you how it feels, only that it makes me think of open fields, of horses racing and glory on their face, and I could tell you what it's not. I could tell you it has nothing to do with bootstrap mentality and meritocracy because freedom ought to be free. I could tell you it has no similar scent to that heaven-bent flavor coming from your mother's kitchen. No, it's, it's much more subtle. It's being able to board and ride a bus with little to no scuffle. It's birthing a boy child and not being afraid that his name is already written on a six-foot shovel. It's the right to learn your God. Understand my conjunction, it's the right to learn you are God. It's being able to sell lemonade without your happiness or innocence being forgotten and raw. It's knowing your cultural anthem and your national anthem without it being forgot. It's seeing red, white, and blue and recognizing delusion in those hues. It's seeing red, green, and black and understanding that your past provides the essence of our true facts. <laughs> Freedom. It's never been so far and so right now. It's never been so induced and contracted. Hmm. It's never been so contrite and able to yield to what is right. I can tell you what it's not. It's overnight. It's express. It's microwaved revolution. Freedom is much more like crock pot than hot pocket. Laying the flavors on the hungry tongues of the young. So that one day their mouths are made to be so bodacious and loud, so bodacious and loud, that when they are asked, what is freedom? They say, they're looking at it. Get free, get free, get free. Freedom is, you know, the removal of the mask. And we're not just talking about the mask in a physical, material form. We're talking about the mask in a mental form, in a political form. We're talking about a, a mask in an in intellectual form. Because I think that we have come through a regime in the last five years of anti-intellectualism. And that has uh, affected our, our country, affected our nation has affected uh, what we aspire to. And we have to recommit ourselves to freedom. It was on this date in 1865, two years after the proclamation had been signed, when word finally arrived that our ancestors had been emancipated, liberated from the bondage of the plantation, no longer obligated to be free labor for this stolen nation, finally unchained from the subjugated shackles of enslavement. Allow me to put this into some proper perspective for the situation. 
Now imagine, imagine the job you've been clocking into never told you that you were free to leave. Leave and pursue your own dreams. And on top of that, you were breaking your back so that they could stay in the black and profit as much as they pleased. Because the labor was cheap. Because you've been clocking in for two years for free. <laughs> now can you see it now? Walking behind that mule in plow, snatching up crops and cotton from the ground, never hearing that trumpet sound, telling them to put their burdens down. Two years before freedom found them under the heat of a Texas sun, mothers and fathers, daughters and sons, still operating under their so-called oppressors, still found themselves in tune with the field holler, hoping a freedom song would soon come, so some may call this day a jubilee, a celebration, the progress of generations moving forward since the order was read in Galveston, and here we stand. The faithful echoes of our ancestors who died, so we could be the voices for the ancestors who died on them slave ships, who suffered the chains and whips, those who were hit with water hoses, beaten, shot, and lynched for every inch marched when injustice wouldn't budge for the sit-ins for never giving up our seat on the bus we shall not be moved we shall overcome and reach the mountaintop by any means necessary we be the descendants of the middle passage we are the children of the ghosts of Tulsa of Rosewood of Wilmington of Osage Ave, of East St. Louis, of neighborhoods that were taken by violence. Today is our liberation day and we will not be silent. We will celebrate loudly until we all hear the trumpet sounds and let the powers that be know that we will not wait two years. We demand our freedom now because we be the movement, a wildfire of faith and hope racing across the nation. 400 years of black reclamation from Charlotte today to 1865 Galveston. Here we shine as proud reflections of survival and determination, the faithful dreams of the souls of Juneteenth on the day they walked off that plantation. And now we stand tall with our fists raised, screaming, free them all, free them all. Free them all. Bartolaban, President and CEO of the Northwest African American Museum, located in Seattle's historic Central District. This year, our museum helped make Juneteenth become an official holiday in Washington State, making us the sixth state in the country to officially designate Juneteenth a holiday. In commemoration of Juneteenth, the Northwest African American Museum is pleased to offer you a song of hope from our African-American cultural ensemble, also known as ACE or ACE. Gospel music plays an important role in keeping black heritage and black ancestral stories alive generation after generation through rhythm and through rhyme. In gospel and inspirational music, there is a message both of reconciliation and compassion, as well as calls for resistance and liberation. This year, the Northwest African American Museum recently formed the African American Cultural Ensemble to meet the sorrow, fatigue, and pain of our times with hope, help, and healing. And so, without further ado, I am pleased to present the world premiere of the Northwest African American Museum's African American Cultural Ensemble as they render a song of hope.
come on. Come on. And if you're tired of people dying, come on. Come on. And if you're tired of people fighting, come on. Come on. No more wars, no more lying, come on. Come on. All the people in the world, come on. Come on. Every boy, every girl, come on. Come on. And if you know that it's over when God says it's over, come on. Come on. Uh, come on. Liberty, faith, and hope, enduring elements of the African-American experience. The Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order issued by United States President Abraham Lincoln on September 22, 1862, during the Civil War. The proclamation declared that all enslaved persons within the rebellious states are and henceforward shall be free. It took effect on January 1st, 1863. However, the enslaved people of Galveston, Texas were not apprised of this proclamation and remained enslaved for an additional two and a half years until June 19, 1865. The Emancipation Proclamation. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas on the 22nd day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States, containing, among other things, the following to wit. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then henceforward and forever free, and the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any effort they may make for their actual freedom. That the executive will on the first day of January aforesaid by proclamation designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof respectively shall then be in rebellion against the United States. And the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto 
at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated, shall in the absence of strong countervailing testimony be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the United States. Now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue of the power in me vested as Commander in Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do on this first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, and in accordance with my purpose to do so publicly, proclaim for the full period of 100 days from the day first above mentioned, order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectfully are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following to wit, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, in which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. The power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. And I hereby enjoin upon the public so declared to be free to abstain from all violence unless in necessary self-defense. And I recommend to them that in all cases when allowed, they labor fruitfully. And I recommend to them that in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution um, upon military necessity. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be a act of justice warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerable judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God and witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington, this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 87th, by the President, Abraham Lincoln, William H. Seward, Secretary of State. Thank you to all of our elected officials for that reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. Perseverance is the continued effort to achieve despite difficulties, barriers, and opposition. Perseverance is one of the principles lifted from the Underground Railroad era that we will see explored by the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, followed by an examining of images and texts related to key historical events illustrating the fortitude of the Louisiana African-American community when facing white supremacy and injustice, presented by the Amistad Research Center located in New Orleans, Louisiana.
This is Little Africa. It's holy ground. Thousands of people risked safety, their lives even, to get here. Just to be free. Cincinnati's been celebrating Juneteenth since 1988. But for some communities, Juneteenth has been something beyond their comprehension. Juneteenth is a story tied to the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. If it were not for communities like Little Africa, a historic moment like Juneteenth may never have occurred. Little Africa was early black settlements right here along the banks of the Ohio River. Perseverance is one of the principles lifted from the Underground Railroad era that we promote along with courage and cooperation. Little Africa, the historical grounds upon where our museum stands, embodies the triumphant spirit of perseverance. While enduring oppressive laws and violence, the families of Little Africa remained steadfast of being of service to countless freedom seekers escaping slavery. 10. It is more than just a symbol of representation of greatness, perfection, and patience, overcoming anxiety and temptation to arrive at your destination. Everyone cannot give 10 because they do not have 10 to give. Dying in sin, they do not know when to live. My ambition is driven by eternity's existence, while my mind's battle with time is internally causing tension. Often I have made that ten to me my enemy and began panicking when things do not get finished. Welcome to the mind of a man who is ignorant of limits. Other than time, there is no opposition. There is no competition. I do not compete with them because our goals are completely different. A man after God's heart trying to lead my people into freedom. I suppose this makes me similar to Moses, a former ten of public housing tenements, but people cannot understand how I overcame that hand that was dealt to me in the land of oppressed men. It is because I have tin within my skin. Embedded in my heart, it is more than just a trend. What does it mean? You have never seen a scene so serene. Nightmare turned into a dream, turned into a vision, turned into dedication which led to perseverance. I guarantee you will remember me. A black owned entity embedded in your memory, respected without penalty. Of course I have made mistakes, but that is what makes me great. My ability to admit that I was wrong and continue without delay. Decades full of headaches, good decisions and bad breaks but people cannot see past what I did in my past days. Rather recognize me for my temper than my tenure. Been doing this for over 10 years. Been doing 10 for a lifetime. I am him. A titan in the lion's den. Truth be told, no lion when I pick up my writing pen. As I begin building monuments, acknowledge and accept my accomplishments. More than a number, more than a statistic, I am 10.
The Amistad Research Center's legacy of fortitude is rooted in the Amistad Incident of 1839, in which 53 Africans were abducted and sold in violation of international law. Attempting to regain their freedom, they revolted. They were jailed and charged with piracy and murder. A group of abolitionists, with help from former President John Quincy Adams, took their case to the United States Supreme Court, which eventually ruled the Africans were free people. The Amistad Research Center celebrates Juneteenth by honoring all who faced oppression and adversity with great courage. These images and text relate to key historical events illustrating the fortitude of the African-American community in Louisiana. The first two ships carrying enslaved Africans arrived in Louisiana in 1719. Most enslaved Africans brought to the state came from the Senegambian region, and by 1795, the population of enslaved Africans in Louisiana numbered close to 20,000. New Orleans became the largest slave market in the nation. At the start of the Civil War in 1860, the number of enslaved individuals in Louisiana stood at 331,726. Those who found themselves as the enslaved did not always actively accept their condition of servitude. It is estimated that there were over 250 slave uprisings in the antebellum South. The largest of these was the Revolt of 1811, when 200 to 500 individuals armed themselves in a violent rebellion, marching from plantation to plantation, beginning from what is now known as Laplace, Louisiana, to New Orleans. Reconstruction brought both gains and losses to the African American. The institution of restrictive laws was in force. Black codes, as they were called, governed and limited liberties granted to the newly freed enslaved, as well as gaining seats in the American government. In less than a decade, more than 200 African American lawmakers were elected and served during Reconstruction. This gave rise to retaliatory forces attempting to reverse these gains. On July 30, 1866, conflict erupted between a group of New Orleans police, firemen, and ex-Confederates, and an African-American delegation seeking entrance into the Louisiana Constitutional Convention. A mob surrounded the building and rushed in and attacked the delegates. Conflict spread into the streets, and over 270 people were killed or wounded, many of them African Americans. That incident galvanized national opposition to the moderate Reconstruction policies of President Andrew Johnson. Republican victories in Congress led to the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, which called for new constitutional conventions. In September of that year, 49 white and 49 black delegates attended the Louisiana Convention and ratified a new state constitution in March 1868. This Bill of Rights was the first in Louisiana to establish integrated public schools and eradicate the state's black codes. Though Oscar J. Don was born into slavery and later freed, Don became the first elected black lieutenant governor of a U.S. state serving from 1868 to 1871. Born free in Georgia in 1837, Pinckney Benton Stewart Pinchback was elected to the Louisiana State Senate in 1868 and became acting lieutenant governor following the death of Oscar J. Don. He then served as interim governor of Louisiana, becoming the first African American to serve as a U.S. governor. Tension between white Democrats and the Republican federal government led to disruptive conflicts throughout the state. In 1873, an all-African American militia seized the Grant Parish Courthouse, fearing a Democratic takeover. A mob of over 150 white men, most members of the Ku Klux Klans and the White Citizen League, surrounded the courthouse, demanding their surrender and over 75 African-American men were shot on sight and hanged. The Koufax Massacre is considered the single bloodiest incident of racial violence recorded during the Reconstruction Era. 
A few graduates of Strait University formed the Comité des Citoyens, Citizens Committee, a civil rights group dedicated to fighting the unjust treatment of freedmen, the Black Codes, and the Separate Car Act of 1890, which forbade African Americans to ride in white-only cars. On June 7, 1892, one of its most prominent members, Homa Plessy, a fair-skinned man of Haitian and French descent, purchased a first-class ticket and boarded an East Louisiana railroad car reserved for white only. Plessy's action was a part of a coordinated effort by the Committee de Citillon to challenge Jim Crow laws of the South. In the following article, the editor of The Crusader, a black daily publication, comments on the irony of the black codes and the U.S. Constitution. To be or not to be, among the many schemes devised by the Southern statement to divide the races, none is so audacious and so insulting as the one which provides separate cars for black and white people on the railroads running through the state. It is a slap in the face of every member of the black race, whether he has the full measure or only one-eighth of that blood. It goes on to say, We are American citizens, and it is our duty to defend our constitutional rights against the encroachments and attacks of prejudice. Sounds familiar? Perseverance and fortitude, enduring elements of the African-American experience. And now, for an excerpt reading of the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Honorable Dr. Carla Hayden, Librarian of Congress. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Let us now explore the tenacity of the city of Detroit as a doorway to freedom during slavery through industry, popular culture, and civic engagement None prove their mettle like the people of the community that is home to the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit, Michigan. Historic Mitchellville Freedom Park on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, will then explore the pride of the descendants of Mitchellville. Through music and interviews, they will share the stories of the Gullah Geechee people and Mitchellville Waymakers. We were one in five million, migrating toward the north to find work for opportunity. Fathers, grandmothers, 140 trains arriving daily, a place known as an underground railroad stop, across the water from another country. Our birth, our starting line, our journey constantly evolving. We were born moving, we were born free. Breaking rocks and racial barriers, leaving a pathway for the ones who come after us. My father came from Madison, Alabama. Some left Mississippi or Georgia, traveling somewhere people with faith in their stride, pride in the tilt of a hat. Sometimes you must move with great intention, with force, with tears, fiercely into the unknown in order to survive. Dream chasers built Detroit, our great city of possibility. We are the children of the Up South movement. We are the bold aortas, those left ventricles, gear shifts, pulmonary arteries, our pistons, transporting blood from the right ventricle, you must search for breath under the hood, inside our chest. Those arteries are connecting rods, carrying blood from the heart, the gas that fuels our machines, that drops off the most important little people in the world to elementary schools at 8 a.m. every morning. Imagine the body of our cars as a body of a people, painted with thousands of extraordinary colors, mufflers as lungs, mufflers as lungs, 
pushing in and breathing out the beauty of innovation, the complexity of history, the necessity of technology, and the simplicity of that road trip you've been dreaming about. Our bones in a semi-line of interchangeable parts, our legs fought against segregation, our arms reached for jobs at Ford Motor Company in 1919, a metropolis of ideas, our minds, the workstations of the future. How we get there and who we bring along for the ride will be the marker for how history defines us. Everyone can't fit in the passenger seat. Some of our families are larger than a sport utility vehicle. Our aunties need a ride to work. We've adopted a few children who must stand in the cold to take the bus or walk to school in the cold winters of America. Humanity is not just oil, it is blood. It is the Amazon thrust of traveling stories, beating, speeding at 200 revolutions per minute. We the economy of black gold survivors. A highway of stars shine bright as our rims. An expressway motor city of tomorrow could include making room for bikes and carpool lanes or an express train that can get citizens across our glove with ease. We are the hope and the heartbreak. A fast car with no brakes. We are the old school cutlass, the Cadillac, the focus. We are the prom date and the first kiss. We are our ancestors' wildest wish. We were born moving. We were born free. Tenacity is the ability of a Aretha to reach that soul note and Smokey to rearrange our tears, to know our city was built on love and Project Window Wonder Men and Supreme Women, the Holy Ghost of Alice Coltrane's heart, the power of Mary and Hayden's hands flying down her base. Follow that sound on your favorite satellite station. Move closer to what really matters to you when you pull out the driveway in the morning. Press down on the pedal. Put the top down. Expand your ideas past seven miles. Put the joy back in Joy Road. My Detroit block that included libraries and schools and walking distance. Our global city created the first highway. There's no reason we can't create a safer way for our families to travel on top of them. Who else to design the transportation of the future than the most resilient workers on the planet? The rewiring of humanity needs humans. Requires delicate components that connect people with luxury and dreams. The way immigrants and migrations and sweat created our automobile empires. Detroit is the starting line of the world's imagination, but it's not about how you start the race or the sacrifices you made to build your life in peace. It's how you found a way to push victoriously to the finish line. And while crossing over that white line, you consider the value of a speech about a mountaintop, an engine as in heart, freedom as a birthright, like breath, like water, like resilience, like struggle, like survival. We are the tenacious backbone of the movement, and we only get to our excellent future when every piece is moving together. The Union Army discovered that Hilton Head Island was a great central and strategic location between Charleston, Beaufort, and Savannah. Since those cities were military strongholds and crucial resupply areas for the Confederate Army, it was the perfect place for the Union Army's headquarters of the South, as well as a place to launch military campaigns. From Hilton Head, operations in several daring missions were launched, some of which involved historic figures like Harriet Tubman and Robert Smalls. Hilton Head's Civil War story begins in November of 1861, when the Union troops entered the Port Royal Sound and invaded the island. The sound of gunboats caused white Confederate soldiers, plantation owners, and residents to flee. They left behind everything, including 10,000 slaves. 
When those first shots were fired, the enslaved island population seized their opportunity for freedom. Despite threats and deception by some local plantation owners, freedom seekers bolted into the woods until the Union's troops occupied the area. Under the protection of the Union, Mitchellville became the destination for waves of freedom seekers fleeing bondage in the nearby Confederate territories of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. It was the place where the newly emancipated would first experience freedom and emerge from being enslaved into responsible citizens. I, even though I grew up here, I was born in Savannah. I grew up here on this island. I stayed with my grandmother. Uh, my mother's mother, and she was a descendant of Richard White. Sometimes in life, big things begin with the simplest of words or the slightest gesture. The story of Mitchellville is just that, a radical idea during a time in our nation's history when the Union forces were trying to win the Civil War as well as figure out how to deal with a large population of newly freed blacks who were dispersed throughout the South. The town of Mitchellville began in 1862 when General Ornsby Mitchell, a former attorney and professor, assumed command of the X Corps and the Department of the South. Good colored people, you have a great work to do and you're in a position of responsibility. This experiment is to give you freedom, position, homes, your families, property, your own soil. It seems to me a better time is coming. A better day is dawning. With these words, Union General Ornsby Mitchell proclaimed that the land of the people of Mitchellville, South Carolina, had once toiled under the chains of slavery, was now their own. When General Mitchell issued the military order freeing the slaves on Hilton Head and nearby Sea Islands, he also provided them with land large enough for a town. Each family was given a plot to grow crops and encouraged to organize their own town, where they were able to buy land, vote, and farm for wages. The fully functioning town created an organizational structure with its own elected officials, taxes and retail stores and compulsory education for children aged 6 to 15, something that had been denied to them as slaves. Their success is especially impressive because the newly freed represented a fusion of various African languages and cultures that are collectively known as Gullah or Geechee. The people of Mitchellville were hungry to learn and after having been denied education for so long, being free to learn to read and write was something that they highly valued. Both adults and children were hungry to be educated. This incredible thirst for knowledge led to Mitchellville establishing the first compulsory education law in South Carolina. By 1862, the town had more than 1,500 residents, some of which had joined the Union Army. Eventually, the population grew to around 3,000 people. Because of its military importance, access to the town was restricted. Even white people were required to have military passes to enter the town's limits. Mitchellville was so successful that Harriet Tubman was sent to Hilton Head to observe the Port Royal Project as a model of future freedmen projects in the U.S. I know what you come for do. I don't know what you come for do. I don't know what you come to do. I don't know what you come to do. But I come to clap my hands. my hands, I come to do my day, my day, I come to feel this groove, this groove. come get you some too, get you so that gets you so can you feel? More call and response. When I say Geechee, you say so. Geechee, so. Geechee, so. When I say Geechee, you say so. Geechee, so. Geechee, 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 so. Geechee, Geechee, so. Geechee, 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 so. Geechee, Geechee, so.
tenacity and pride, enduring elements of the African-American experience. And now for an excerpt reading of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, notable educator, author, and icon, Dr. Janetta Besh Cole. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty, or property without due process of law, nor denied to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Thank you, Dr. Cole. The National Civil Rights Museum of Memphis, Tennessee will educate you on the meaning of Juneteenth and creative ways to celebrate the joy of the holiday. We are then headed west to explore resiliency pre and during the COVID-19 era in America. We will explore the continued fight for our freedom in the face of injustice presented by the California African American Museum located in Los Angeles, California. Hi, and welcome to the National Civil Rights Museum at the former Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm Dory Lerner, K-12 Museum Educator. I'm here to celebrate with you and honor Juneteenth. This year, we're doing a special Juneteenth edition of our Small But Mighty Storytime in order to collaborate with blackfreedom.org, which is several different black institutions all coming together to honor and celebrate Juneteenth. So this year, we're going to read a book with you and we're gonna show you a special cooking demonstration. So I'd like to start with this book called All Different Now, Juneteenth, The First Day of Freedom. This book was written by Angela Johnson and illustrated by E.B. Lewis and it was published by Simon and Schuster, Books for Young Readers. A June morning breeze off the port blew the smell of honeysuckle past the fields across the yard. And into our room to wake us. Have you ever smelled something delicious and sweet like honeysuckle? Mm, what a nice thing to wake up to. And nobody knew as we ate a little, talked a little, and headed to the fields as the sun was rising that soon it would all be different. Then we worked and worked and worked some more under the hot Texas sun until word spread from the port to town through the countryside and into the fields. That a union general had read from a balcony that we were all now and forever free and things would all be different now. I watched as my Aunt Laura sang as she held her baby. Mr. Jake, who some say was a hundred, cried quietly, and a group of grown people bowed their heads and whispered things to each other that I could not hear. My mama held my hand softly and looked beyond as another breeze blew over and everything fell to a hush. But later, Papa, Mama, the aunts and uncles, and all of my cousins had an afternoon picnic by the water my baby brother crawled around our blanket as we listened to the sounds of the waves. As more people joined us, we ate as free people, laughed as free people, and told stories as free people on into the night. What was before would be no more. As we walked back home, the cool of the night soothed our tired feet that padded quietly past the shadowy fields of cotton. And in the morning, the smell of honeysuckle will wake me again beside my sisters and brother to a time that will be for all of us all different now. 
So everyone, I know this book wasn't direct in explaining the Juneteenth holiday, so I want you to know there are lots of other books out there that get more specific about what Juneteenth was originally about, meaning how the holiday started. Juneteenth for Maisie is another great book. So if you're, I'd say pre-K through maybe first or second grade, Juneteenth for Maisie by Floyd Cooper is a great book to check out. If you're maybe a second or third grader, Juneteenth Jamboree by Carol Boston Weatherford, illustrated by Yvonne Buchanan. Or if you are a fourth or fifth grader, check out Juneteenth by Vonda Michaud Nelson and Drew Nelson, illustrated by Mark Schroeder. So everyone, I want you to know this holiday is about joy. And at the Civil Rights Museum, we are honored to share joy with you and remind you to share joy with your family and friends as you celebrate Juneteenth this year. And now I'd like to introduce our special guest, Chef Tanaka. Hi, Chef Tanaka. Thank you Hi. for being with me today. Yes, thank you. I'm so pleased of um, being here today. Thank Welcome. you for having me. Absolutely. Hey, you guys, I am Chef Tanaka, and today we will be creating my favorite in a delicious Juneteenth celebration tea. So we're gonna start out with what you need. You need some fresh ripe strawberries. Of course, we gotta have our blueberries because we gotta incorporate our uh, Juneteenth flag. And we cannot go without our hibiscus tea bags. Now, if you don't have, um, you can't find hibiscus tea bags in the store, you always can use a uh, black tea that you can find in any local grocery store. We have some ice and we also have a blender. So we're gonna start with our tea bags. We have some boiling water here. We have some fresh strawberries already um, diced up. And I'm gonna use my little ninja. So we're gonna add all our strawberries that we chopped up. So about four cups. And it's okay. gonna give it a beautiful red color, right? Yes, it's gonna give it a beautiful red color. So, you know, that's why we're going with the strawberries. You can also substitute it with the watermelon mm -hmm. because it's symbolic to use a red drink during Juneteenth. That was fast. And I have a mesh here. And we're just gonna place it on top of our dispenser. Oh, it smells so good. Now, you don't want to press it too hard because you don't want your tea to become cloudy. So we're going to take a wooden spoon and we're going to stir just gently just to get the juice. And our tea is almost done because I can see the colors. It's so vibrant red and brownish color. It looks amazing. You so, want me to come stir the strawberries? Sure, if you don't mind, that'll be awesome. Right. So I'm going to take some of my ice here. Okay, so I think Miss Dory got us going over here. So now I am going to take Gosh, the so strawberry good. syrup. Yes. And we're gonna add it here. And then we're gonna take a little bit of our tea. Now remember this is very hot, so be careful. Let an adult do it for you. Okay, so we're gonna place our top on. And then we're going to create us a slush. Now, if it's not um, thick enough, you always can add some more ice. So we're going to grab that glass over there. So we're going to shake it up so we can get all our slushy out. Yeah, we might have to use our spoon to assist it. This is a great project for doing outside if you can. Yes. If you make a mask. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. That's for you. Put that one down. Thank and you. And of course, I have to have one too. Absolutely. The chef has to taste her creation. Now remember, this is naturally sweetened. So you guys, if you want to add sugar, go ahead and add it um, during the process before you blend. That's a cup and a half of granulated white sugar. Okay? Good. So we're going to save the rest of this for something else. Now, story if you I want to add fresh strawberries and blueberries to mine just because hey the flag has red white and blue so I want all of mine yeah, so yeah go. and I'm gonna Put stick my on strawberry side. on the side the blueberries on the yes top. blueberry on the top and we have some straws here beautiful cheers. and cheers to Juneteenth to Juneteenth to freedom yes. and to joy homemade popsicles now make sure you do this at least a day in advance. Go ahead and make your tea, uh, celebration tea up and pour it in each mold. Freeze it for eight mm. to 24 hours. On Juneteenth, which is the 19th, you pull those popsicles out and enjoy in the summer breeze. Um, this has been delicious. I enjoy it. Thank you so much, Ms. Dory, for allowing me to be a part sure. of today. 
and I hope you guys enjoy Juneteenth just as much as I will. And I'll be celebrating with some fabulous old fashioned chicken and um, buttermilk cornbread and also collard greens on Juneteenth along with my celebration tea. Awesome. Thank you so much for teaching Thank us to you. make Juneteenth celebration tea, everybody. We hope that you will go online and check out our recipe for this amazing tea Chef Tanaka has come up with. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. So you can find the recipe at blackfreedom.org. You can also find our book list of the books that we read today and books we talked about. And you can even find the template for making our Juneteenth flag. So everybody, thanks for celebrating Juneteenth with us. And we hope you have a joyous day. Resilience to me means remembering our joy and our purpose and our meaning despite all circumstances. There are so many waves that come with life and resilience I think is always remembering our why. Resilience to me uh, means the ability to persevere with grace and fortitude uh, no matter what challenges come your way. Uh, we've had a ton of challenges in the last year so we've needed a ton of resilience. Overcoming is one of the first words that comes to mind when I think of resilience and just finding an inner strength to move forward. And also there's a combination of confidence and faith because I feel like in resilience, you have the faith to know that you need to move forward. And it's not always clear how or what it's gonna take to get you there. And if what you're hoping that you're moving towards is going to be there but you have to find the inner strength and faith to get to that point. And when I think of my personal resilience or what resilience means to me personally, I think of all of those words, just confidence and faith and just overcoming and bouncing back. When we think about time, you know, there's a temporal nature of things go from here to there and resiliency is the ability to uh, still be present, still to be tangible um, as time passes. Resilience means to me getting through tough times, making it to the other end, just kind of stay in the course until you get to a right space. Resilience to me means to continue to fight despite. I think I have demonstrated and experienced resilience through allowing myself to fully feel and experience all the, you know, surprising and shocking and unprecedented news and really allowing myself to be human and fully be in the experience and let those feelings and those experiences teach me. So whether it's joy or sorrow or anger or rage or frustration, like fully feeling those things has helped me remember what I feel like my purpose is and what I really want to contribute to this world and how I want to help, whether that's being there with my family more, whether that's contributing to activist spaces more, whether that's making sure I write and paint and create my work. Um, I feel more motivated than ever through resilience to, to live fully. Regardless of what you want the world to be, and you always want to work for that, you always have to see the world as it is. 
and you have to have that belief that uh, things will get better and that you have the power to uh, make things better. Sometimes you can't make things as much better as you would like to, but it's like football. You just have to keep moving the ball forward. I've learned from my ancestors in regards to resilience that it's not a fleeting trend. Resilience is not something that was only for our ancestors, but it's an idea and a concept that we can all adopt and use it to be able to move forward. We're just stronger, we're more powerful together. When we amplify our voices and join together, um, it really creates this change and nothing happens overnight. But I think with resilience, it's again, just working hard and towards something that you're hoping will at the end of the finish line be there. And so we don't know what's gonna happen 10 days from now, but just staying in the course, being resilient and leaning upon each other, I think is just absolutely the key to kind of moving forward and hoping for better outcomes. Joy and resilience, enduring elements of the African-American experience. And now for an excerpt reading of the 15th Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Mr. Lonnie Bunch. The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the account of race, color, or the previous condition of servitude. Thank you, Mr. Bunch. Through a presentation from our friends at the America's Black Holocaust Museum, located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we will explore victory and the history of Juneteenth Day in the city of Milwaukee, highlighting the city's ongoing commitment to recognizing this critical moment in our collective narrative. The death of a star recalibrates our gravity, infuses energy, sets into motion celestial winds of change. We mourn the loss and reclaim the sun. Once a star becomes a sun, we breathe galactic. We take in the same molecules and sky fragments of greatness. We assemble ourselves around a truth, blazing like a beacon. Welcome to America's Black Holocaust Museum. This is a continuation of our virtual programming of which we will focus on Juneteenth, an historic celebration in America. We will look at the celebration locally here in Milwaukee, regionally here in the Midwest, and nationally. You know, Juneteenth is in many respects the single most important holiday in the history of African Americans, particularly because of the ways in which it recognizes not only the end of slavery, but the commencement of full and complete citizenship. And so as much as we think about the ending of that horrific institution, we have to also remain very, very aware of how important Juneteenth is in recognizing what is to become for four million or so folks exiting that institution. Juneteenth is also very powerful in its expression of the oral tradition. This holiday continues, it proliferates, it extends beyond generations, and at the very same time, connecting generations of African-Americans to that fundamental principle 
of what it means to be free in the United States. We are excited about Juneteenth Day. We celebrate it in, in Milwaukee. We celebrate it in Racine and Kenosha. Uh, we celebrate it all over the state, and uh, it's a great time. It's a time we, we celebrate our freedom. However, we didn't actually receive our freedom on June 19, 1865, but it's a day in which we celebrate that freedom. It's a time for reunion and a time for reflection. It's a time to renew your commitment to your African brothers and sisters. Uh, it's a time to walk free as equal citizens. In 1971, businesses were leaving the community, people were selling their houses, moving out of the neighborhood, and one of the staff people was visiting her grandparents in Georgia. And they were celebrating an event called June June Day, which, which is our Juneteenth celebration. Juneteenth started uh, in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. Northcott has one of the largest and oldest Juneteenth Day celebrations in the country. We get anywhere from 80,000 people throughout the course of a day participating in Juneteenth. We're also going to do an encampment of black soldiers that telling the history of what Juneteenth is all about and explaining what the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment is all about. So it's going to be a really exciting time for us this year. Last year, we, we, we didn't do Juneteenth because of the pandemic but we're really looking to do some bigger and better things. This year, we're really going to try to educate and bring our community closer together. Uh, it's really a big event that we've been putting on for the last 50 years. We each be stars glowing from our seats, anchoring disparate orbits around this moment, translating this explosion of legacy and starlight into a promise of a new American day. Today, we breathe galactic, expansive. My name is Dasha Kelly Hamilton, Poet Laureate for the city of Milwaukee and for the state of Wisconsin. On behalf of America's Black Holocaust Museum, thank you for joining us. Victory, an enduring element of the African-American experience. Juneteenth serves as a starting point for us, a reference point in time, compelling us to consider how much further we can go if we just know, and if we act boldly on our knowledge. Juneteenth reminds us to be aware, to boldly challenge unfulfilled promises. Recognizing Juneteenth serves an important role in acknowledging the promise of freedom afforded by the end of slavery and the more equitable future for which we continue to strive. Thank you for tuning into this year's Black Freedom Collective National Virtual Juneteenth Commemoration. Keep lifting your voice.